Perfect. Hey, thanks everyone for uh, joining us today. Uh, my name is Ian Porzondek. I'm with the Business Development Group here at St. Clair Systems. Uh, today, Mike Bonner, our uh, VP of Engineering and Technology, uh, is going to be our presenter. Uh, today, we're going to present Spray Vision. Uh, so for today's webinar, uh, it will be interactive. Uh, first, Mike will give about a 35-minute presentation, uh, and then we'll use the remaining time for questions. If you do have a question during the presentation, feel free to enter it in the chat box. Uh, and then when it comes time for the questions, we'll start with the questions that are in the chat box. Uh, and then after that, we can, um, we can everyone, if you wanna come on video uh, and raise your hand, feel free to, and then we can proceed that way. Uh, so right now I'll turn it over to Mike, and then uh, we're gonna learn about spray vision. Okay, great. Thanks, Ian. Um, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. I'm Mike Bonner, and today we're going to talk. We're going to introduce some exciting new technology for us, um, and actually for anyone who sprays coating out of their parts. But before we dive into it, uh, let's first introduce the players. I think we're going to introduce the players. Let's see if I can get this rolling. There we go. Um, if you're not familiar with St. Clair Systems. We design and manufacture advanced point of use temperature and viscosity control systems for industrial fluid dispensing processes. Now there's a mouthful for you. Now we've been doing that since 1990. And during that time, we've amassed more than 3,500 active installations all over the globe. We specialize in both recirculating and dead end systems. And we handle low viscosity materials like water and solvents that are less than one centipoise all the way up to really high viscosity materials like sealers and adhesives that are well in excess of a million centipoise. Now, to handle these, we have to be able to work at pressures anywhere from five PSI or 0.4 bar uh, to more than 400 bar or more than 6,000 PSI. So who cares? And the answer is lots of folks, as you can see here. Uh, this spans a myriad industries like automotive and steel, plastics and composites, um, nanomaterials, food packaging, pharmaceuticals, and, and sporting goods, just to name a few. Now, each successful project with demanding customers like these has increased our understanding of the ramifications of temperature and viscosity in a host of fluid dispensing applications. Now, yes, this is a shameless advertisement for St. Clair Systems, but since many of these are, are critical finishing application, uh, it's also the reason that we're qualified to recognize cool new technology when we see it. And that's exactly what happened with Spray Vision. Uh, located in Ostrava in the, the Czech Republic, Spray Vision was founded in 2017 on the idea of providing a means for paint applicators to literally see the outcome of their painting process before they painted the first part. And this reduces defects and improves overall quality, reduces costs by reducing setup time, paint usage, and, and all at the same time, increasing first pass yield. Uh, and that reduces rework, rejects, and scrap. Now, this is not a simulation. It's a measurement of the actual film pattern that you're dispensing. The system was first introduced at the Paint Expo in 2018, held in uh, Karlsruhe, Germany. And this last November, Spray Vision was voted the best idea of 2020 out of 171 entries at Vodafone's Idea of the Year contest. By the end of 2020, they already had achieved a base of more than 35 installations worldwide. Also in 2020, we signed on as Spray Vision's exclusive North American distributor because we were impressed with their really innovative diagnostic technology, which is complementary to our technology in our opinion. And our technology is designed to maintain the consistency of your process from the first part to the last. So this year, 2021, we're going to add this to the product line of St. Clair Systems India. As the folks at Spray Vision put it, it's not what you look at that matters. It's what you see. And this is a kind of an indication 
of how this all works out. So you're probably asking yourself, what is spray vision? Um, this new technology is a combination of spray capture hardware combined with proprietary spray vision software. And it captures a spray pattern that performs various measurement and analysis functions on the captured images. It displays it in that popular color heat map format used in finite element analysis and thermal photography, and like you see here in the picture. The color representation allows you to actually see and quickly visually assess what's really happening in your paint process. Uh, the numerical measurements available allow you to objectively measure things like pattern features, like uh, height, width, volume, and, and even film thickness. And then there's droplet analysis features like size, volume, and distribution. There's even a time-lapse feature that allows you to watch the flash-off characteristics of the coating as it's happening. I think it's pretty easy when you look at this image to see the uneven distribution in the bell pattern. And that begins to show you the value of what you're looking at. Now, the hardware in the system consists of the spray capture unit and a set of drawdown bars for calibration. There are two sizes of spray capture units available, the A3 size and the A2 size. Now, these are based on European paper sizes, so the A2 is the bigger of the two. The spray capture unit connects to the spray vision software where all captures are processed, stored, and displayed. Finally, comes the consumables, and these are the foils for capturing spray patterns and for calibrating the unit to a given paint. It includes capture tape for complex shapes and spot capture circles for spot measurements. Let's take a minute and examine each of these in a little bit greater detail. Like I said, the spray vision system is built around the spray capture unit, which is available in two sizes. These are named for the European paper sizes, which relate to the available capture area, not the size of the unit, okay? Um, the smaller A3 system is more commonly used for gun spray applications, it has an available capture area of 420 millimeters by 297 millimeters. Now for the, us over here, that's 16 and a half by 11.7 inches. Now, while it acts a little like a scanner, this is not your typical HP desktop scanner, okay? Weighing in at 35 kilograms or about 77 pounds, this is designed for industrial use. It's constructed from steel and glass and really good stuff. And it has a really, really robust feel. The larger A2 system is twice the size of its little brother, and it's commonly used for bell applications. It sports a capture area of 420 by 594 millimeters, which is 16 and a half by 23.4 inches, and it weighs in at a whopping 56 kilograms, and that's about 123 pounds. Both units have a graphical touchscreen interface, but the most innovative feature of this capture technology is that it's designed to accept capture films while they're still wet which allows for immediate analysis without waiting until after the curing process is completed, like it's common in traditional paint quality systems. Now, the last piece of hardware that's required is a set of drawdown bars, and these are used in conjunction with the calibration foils. We're gonna talk about that in a minute, but to calibrate the unit to each of the paints that you're using, you have to calibrate them all, we'll talk about that too. Um, Though any drawdown bar can be used, these are sized specifically for use with the calibration foils. The Spray Vision Capture hardware is combined with the proprietary Spray Vision software, which performs various functions in the capture and analysis process. Now, this is a cloud-based application, and it stores and interprets the data captured from the sprayed film. It provides full database features and the calibration utility, which as I mentioned, allows it to be quickly correlated to any paint or coating used in the process. In addition, it features advanced analysis tools, including capture analysis, pattern comparison, process control, 
droplet analysis, transfer efficiency, and time-lapse capability, which I already noted, is a great tool for analyzing what happens during solid flash-off. The system even has a utility that will automatically generate reports. The consumables are, are comprised mostly of the Kapton films and tapes used to capture the spray patterns in the first place. Now, Kapton is both solvent and heat resistant. It's capable of handling cured temperatures of 150 degrees C, or about 300 degrees Fahrenheit, for up to 20 minutes, and lower temperatures for a lot longer. Uh, the capture foils are non-adhesive and come in both A2 and A3 sizes to match the two spray capture units. That being said, uh, the smaller A3 foils can be used on the A2 capture unit without any issue. The calibration foils are a special version of the A3 foil, and they've got a printed matrix on them that's used with the calibration routine to calibrate to specific paints and coatings. Finally, you've got the adhesive tapes and then the adhesive dots that are used to capture complex shapes and target areas on small parts. So who can benefit from this technology? It's a pretty long list, but just in general, aerospace, automotive, tier one and tier two, industrial finishers, wood finishers, paint labs, equipment suppliers, and, and in fact, anybody who sprays parts. So with all of this, it's reasonable to ask, how does this fit into my process? And the short answer is everywhere like a glove, okay? Um, spray vision instantly becomes a critical part of the painting process. It impacts every aspect of every procedure from the setup of new parts and new colors to the control of the quality of the outcomes and even in the troubleshooting of defects when they occur. We start with process control where we can examine the tools of the system for pattern analysis, process control, um, defect analysis, and troubleshooting. With an understanding of what tools are available and how they work, we can then move on to how they can be used to shorten the setup of new parts and new paints and new colors and even new suppliers while simultaneously improving the quality of the parts you're producing. So let's start with spray patterns. There are generally two types of spray patterns that we're concerned with, static and dynamic. The static spray pattern is a brief shot from the gunner belt to establish the spray pattern dimensions, specifically the height, width, and volume. Also important, uh, the atomization, as shown by the droplet size and distribution. Now, the dynamic pattern puts the static pattern in motion, and so may be more representative of how the system will perform when you're actually spraying parts. For analysis purposes, this is usually in the form of a single pass right across the width of the fill, like is shown here. Now, one or both are commonly used as test dots prior to spraying parts. Now, test dots are commonly used at the beginning of a shift or right after a break or after gun cleaning or rebuild. Though there are systems available on the market to test guns or bells after you rebuilt them, any good operator knows to check their pattern before they start spraying to make sure they don't uh, see any problems. This applies to both robotic and manual painting operations. The problem is this is often done on craft paper, you know, white or brown, uh, depending on the paint color that's being applied, which while a cheap, readily available, and easily disposable solution, it's almost always uh, a different texture than the parts being painted. And, and it'll likely also be more absorbent, absorbent and, and therefore it draws solvent from the test shot. And that changed the way it looks, which means it may change the way that you see issues. So you have to ask yourself, can my test shots answer these four questions? First, will my film build be correct? Second, will my film build be even across my part? Third, will the atomization support my required finish quality? 
And finally, will problems develop during flash off? Now, you're probably not surprised that spray vision can answer all of them, right? Um, but let's take a look at how the spray vision system answers each of these questions. The answer to what will my film build be is in the calibration process. The first step in any testing protocol is to calibrate the system. And in this case, you calibrate the spray vision system to the paint that will be applied. Now, the spray vision calibration tool provides a step-by-step -step procedure that creates a calibration profile that correlates the spray vision or the spray capture intensity rather, and it correlates those measurements uh, with the film thickness tools that you're currently using in your process. So a calibration profile has to be generated for each paint used in the process, but it can be stored and reused every time that paint is run. Now, this is the only spray vision process that requires that the film be cured. The process involves doing drawdowns on a special calibration film, like you see in the picture here, which is then captured wet and stored in the spray vision software before being cured, usually in a lab oven, but because the Kapton film is impervious to most curing temperatures, it can also be run through your normal curing process. After cure, dry film thickness measurements are made with your standard QC tools and entered into the calibration tool to generate and store the calibration profile. And once the calibration profile is assigned to a capture, all measurements will be converted to dry film thickness units. If you have any doubts at any time, you can take the film you're working on, you can cure it and check the DFT again with your normal QC tools. So you always have a way of getting back and confirming the accuracy of your measurements. Now the answer to will my film build be even across my part is all answered in the SB50 process. Now SB50 stands for spritz build 50%. It's a German term. Basically 50% of the pattern. And this process takes either a static or dynamic profile and it determines the maximum film thickness across that profile. In this case, it's 18 microns. Then it locates the points where the film is 50% of the maximum. In this case, nine microns. Then it simply calculates the distance between them. In this case, 20 centimeters. Now, this is the optimum distance between your robot pads for this particular gun setup. Now, here's the way it works. If the distance between your robot paths is greater than the SB50, then there's gonna be insufficient paint in the overlap areas, and the result is striping or uneven film build. Similarly, if the distance between your robot paths is less than the SB50, then the thick areas overlap, and there's too much paint in the overlap area. But the result, again, is striping, and again, uneven film build. But if the distance between the paths is set up equal to the SB50, as we can see, the paint distribution is much more even with no detectable striping. Now, this is the value that your robot programmer needs to get his or her job done. Now, the SB50 is complemented by the transfer efficiency calculation utility of the system. The first thing that you do is to select the capture pattern for which to calculate the transfer efficiency. Then you enter the application settings, including the fluid flow in cc's per minute, the travel velocity in millimeters per second, and the solids content in percent by volume. Next, select the atomizer type from the drop-down list and then simply click the calculate button and the result is calculated and displayed. Now, the bar graph shows the transfer efficiency in percent. If it's within the range for the atomizer you selected, the bar will be green, otherwise it will be red. The range for each of the atomizers shown in the list um, are, are shown in the list at right. On, on the screen here. And you can see that your selection is highlighted 
to make it easy to quickly compare your results with the range that's common for that particular atomizer. Okay, the answer to will the atomization support my required finish quality is in this system's ability to capture and analyze patterns at the droplet level. Called droplet analysis, this process allows a small select area to be captured and processed with extremely fine detail. Once the capture is completed, the captured area is broken down into nine smaller sub areas which can then be viewed and analyzed separately. The system measures both droplet area and volume and reports key statistics like the minimum, the maximum, the average, and the sum of all the droplets in that area. And they also can be compared to the total area from each sub area. Now, often finished defects occur during the initial solvent flash off. So the answer to will problems develop during flash off is found in the system's ability to capture and analyze multiple patterns over time. This is called time lapse. And this process, like with droplet analysis, it allows a small select area to be captured and processed with extremely fine detail. But this capture is repeated at user-defined intervals for a user-defined period of time. Once the captures are completed, the system compiles them into a video string for deeper visual analysis. Now, one of the most useful tools in the spray vision arsenal is the process control utility. This compares a selected pattern to a known gold standard. Now, in its evaluation, it considers shape, volume, width, and height. Each parameter is graphed by percentage match to the gold standard. And the value shows red if the match is below the threshold that you set. The actual metrics are also listed at the bottom. Uh, that allows you to investigate further if you need to. The nice part about this tool is it provides an immediate go, no go result before you paint your first part. This makes it's a great process control tool. Now, process control provides two specific services. When used proactively before the start of production, like I was just talking about, it assures that you'll deliver a pattern that will produce the expected result. I mean, clearly, if you set the paint system up to operate with a gold standard on the left, and you start to paint with a pattern on the right, you can expect significantly poorer results with appearance problems like striping, low film, poor color match at the very least. With the process control utility, this is totally unnecessary. You can avoid these problems right before you start painting. The other use for this tool is in troubleshooting. And this can be invaluable when you're analyzing defects. So let's look at how that works. In this example, defects are found on the hood of a production vehicle, or more likely on a string of them by this time. And the preliminary examination suggests that the striping is only on the right side of the vehicle, suggesting that it could relate to the atomizer on that robot. Now, there's a couple of ways to handle this. First, you could place the foils directly on the hood uh, and run it through the process as is shown here. The static Dynamic and 3D patterns, however, can, can quickly identify the source of the problem without wasting a part. Now, clearly, all three patterns show the source of the stri striping defect on the right robot. Now, most users already have um, a program ready to run in their test patterns so that they can do this whenever it's necessary. So you can call that up in seconds, scan, and within a minute or two, understand exactly that you're ready to operate. Now, each of the tools that we've talked about so far can be applied to setup. 
every part you paint requires setup of your paint line. And that setup will be different for every paint, every color, even every supplier. If you've got two different suppliers supplying the same paint. So here's how the spray vision tools make this task faster, easier, and more accurate to produce better results. Now, to make their product more attractive to a, a wider array of painters, robot makers have created highly advanced digital program simulation tools to assist with the job of programming the robot or robots in the painting process. Many can even work directly off your CAD data, which is really cool, but all require that the gun or bell pattern be fed to the program. Without knowledge of the atomizer pattern, the simulator cannot begin to determine the optimal path for the part. As a result, the outcome of the finishing process depends on that spray pattern. Any change in pattern means a change in finish quality. Now, this isn't a secret. The, the robotics manufacturers understand this. They're smart guys. Um, like the DER program is called the DXQ3D, and they state right in their literature, the software simulations do not take into account specific paints. For that reason, the process simulation concept includes a real life test in the DER test laboratory as a second step after the virtual optimization. The customer's chosen paint materials are used in this test. The values measured are used in the third and last step to translate the virtual parameters used in the simulation, such as spray pattern width and percentage discharge rate, into the parameters necessary for the paint atomizer. Now, it looks like I'm picking a Dur, but like I said, every simulation system has the same limitation. So really, the question you've got to ask is, do you have the time to wait for them to receive your samples and determine your setup parameters for every paint and every part that you need to paint? The key here is that the spray vision system does this for you on your line with your atomizers on your schedule. Plus, it allows you to check your work. As I mentioned in the example that we just looked at, the same foils that we use for spray patterns can also be used to monitor our finish application right on our parts. First, you apply the foils to the areas of concern as shown here in this picture. You can cut the foils to the size or shape required to get them to lay flat on the surface. And you can use the tape and or the, the little dots for complex shapes and for spot locations. Then you click the paint, uh, you, you set the paint and you paint as normal. But instead of sending it to cure like you normally would, you simply remove the wet foils, tapes and spots. You got to make sure to observe the orientation that they're in on the part, but then you scan those foils, tapes, and spots, again, paying attention to the orientation, so that you can line them up again and identify the part of the program that they correlate to. After capture, you can use all of the spray vision tools to determine the results and identify any issues that need to be addressed in the program. You can repeat as many times as required to resolve the issues, but each cycle will be on a short turn because there's no curing time required. This can save many, many hours in the programming process. So what kind of issues can Spray Vision help you solve? Well, obviously, since it reads out in dry film thickness units, it can help you detect film build issues. And and avoid related defects like color match, gloss, orange peel, and things like that. And it's the only system I've seen that can help you identify flash off issues before cure. Many pattern and finish problems can be related to viscosity issues created when you set the paint up in the first place. But we're gonna talk more about that in just a second. Just be aware of it. So there's typically spray issues like paint flow problems, air imbalances, worn nozzles, and, and dirty atomizers. There's probably a host of others that I have thought to include on this slide, 
and maybe even some that are unique to your specific operation that you're thinking of right now. Now, here's another example. Um, here we can see three different spray conditions. The first capture shows a dynamic performance with a flow of 180 cc's per minute and three bar for both atomization and shaping air. Now, that's about 43 and a half PSI for the rest of us. Now, the center capture shows the dynamic performance with the flow increased to 220 cc's per minute, but still with three bar for both atomizing and shaping air. Now, that's an increase in flow of about 22%. Our last capture shows the dynamic performance with the flow still at 220 cc's per minute and the same three bar for atomizing air, but with the shaping air reduced to two and a half bar. That's about 36 PSI. Now, when we look at the spray vision metrics for these, some really interesting things stand out. The first capture shows an SB50 metric of over 81 millimeters and a transferred volume of roughly 207 cubic millimeters and a maximum dry film thickness of seven and a quarter microns. Now, when we increase the flow, as shown in the middle capture, um, we can see that our SB50 drops by over 22%, which of course is about the same amount as our flow increase, and that drops to a little less than 63 millimeters. Our transfer volume, on the other hand, increases by more than 32% to about 274 and a half cubic millimeters, and our maximum dry film thickness increases by nearly 40% to about 10 millimeters. Now, in our last example here on the right, we dropped the shaping air by about 17%. Though the SP50 remains relatively unchanged, we get an additional 18% boost in the transferred volume to over 323 cubic millimeters with an additional 25% boost in the maximum dry film thickness. Now, what's happened here is this fine tuning, yes, has increased our paint flow by 22%, but it's reduced our total airflow and has increased our film build by over 75% and our transferred volume by over 56%. And that represents a significant boost in transfer efficiency. And this can mean higher robot speeds, so faster completion and higher throughput. So does paint really matter? And I mentioned that you have to check every paint for every program. And we sometimes get questions about how much difference that really makes. And I think we know that every paint has its own characteristics, but I would submit that even the same paint at different temperatures behaves differently. A great example comes from some work that we did in the first week of January here with CFAN. They are the coolest company that you've ever seen, uh, just fantastic processes. But they were the first company to manufacture an FAA approved composite jet engine fan blade. And they make lots of them for GE Aerospace. The thing about it is being aerospace, they have exceedingly tight specs on everything, dimension, materials, and it extends all the way to the finish on the part. And anyway, we ran a series of tests in which all of the spray parameters were held constant, and the only change was the temperature of the paint so as to change its viscosity. Now, here we can see the change in dynamic pattern over the 40 degree Fahrenheit change in temperature from 70 Fahrenheit to 110 Fahrenheit, which by the way, is not a stretch for Central Texas. Now, when we plot, plotted that, uh, we can see the significant change in transfer volume as a function of viscosity. We saw similar data with the static pattern size versus viscosity, as shown here, and with every other measurement that we perform. In short, viscosity has a significant impact on system performance, and therefore, 
every paint needs to be tested. And yes, not only does that mean every paint needs to be tested, but it needs to be tested under controlled conditions, which you can reproduce in your process. Now, that's a lot to put on a remote lab and rely on them for the results. Okay, so everybody's thinking, is this technology affordable? And even the brightest technology is useless if it can't pay for itself. Our customers have used these criteria for their return on investment calculations. First, a 25% reduction in programming time right up front before you even painted your first part. And then a 20 to 30% reduction in paint usage. A two point improvement in orange peel on the ACT scale. A five to seven GU improvement in gloss. A three to 5% increase in first time yield. And a two and a half percent reduction in rework. And even the detection of system and equipment failure prior to spraying parts. Okay, so we made it through. Uh, again, I want to thank you for taking the time to be here today. And though we've really only scratched the surface of what the spray vision system can, can bring to your paint operation, uh, hopefully we've opened a new window through which to evaluate your process. So Ian, I've been a little busy over here. Um, have we got any questions in the chat area we can start with? Uh, we do, Mike. Um, so before I ask the one question, uh, I know most are probably going to want to know how much does it cost? Fair question. Um, feel free to reach out to Mike or myself. Uh, you'll see our email addresses listed, uh, and then we can have further conversations regarding that. Uh, but Mike, the, the one question that we do have, can the pattern of any liquid paint be measured and characterized, for example, mica? Yes, it can. Um Obviously, there's a, a hiding factor that, that we consider, and a lot of paints are rated by their hiding characteristics. Micas and metallics, of course, have opaque materials in them, but you would be surprised uh, how much light they transmit in spite of the fact that they're, they have good hiding. So every paint, if put on thick enough, will block all of the light through it, and you can only scan up to that potential. But at the films that we traditionally lay down on our parts, um, we're well inside of that. So yes, the spray vision system can work with virtually any coating that, that you're dealing with. All right, thank you. Um, next question, can we see the film thickness on the actual parts in a simulation? For example, in an ABB robot studio simulation? Uh, you could. The whole thing is you're going to put the film over your part and spray onto the film, and then you just peel it right off and lay it down on the scanner bed itself and then scan that. The calibration process converts all of those measurements right to, to DFT, and you can pick any point on there. So it's, it's infinite across the scan, and you can pick any point on that capture and you can measure it by simply hovering over the top of it. And you can identify what that film build is in that area. So you can see your light and dark areas visually through the color map, but you can also measure them directly in the spray vision tool. I hope that answers the question. Uh, I think so. So I, I guess what you're saying is, so whether it's in someone's process or in a studio in a lab environment, um, since we're using the capture unit, that can be done anywhere. That's correct? That's correct. Um, another question, Mike. Um, get to ask this quite a bit. Uh, so does it measure wet film thickness or dry film thickness? Um, the answer is kind of yes. Um, basically what it's doing is it's measuring the intensity that it can read through the film of paint across the entire capture area. And then the calibration process relates the, those intensity measurements in the wet film 
to the drive film that you measure. And like, like I said earlier, you actually take that calibration film and you spray it, you scan it wet, and then you cure it so the paint is dry. You come back with your standard tools, be it um, a, a Defelsco or whatever else you're using in your QC lab, and you measure it with your tools. The important part about that is that it's going to give you the same reading on the spray vision that you're going to get if you take that part, that um, measurement unit to the part and measure it yourself. So you'll get the same thing because you correlated the spray vision tool to your in-house tools. So now you're going to get the same results. The beauty of it is you've correlated the wet film to the actual dry film, the cured dry film. So it's not a calculation like many simulations where you say, well, it's 50% volume solids, so I know my film will be 50% of my wet film. This actually does the correlation directly. And like I say, we just did a bunch of this last week. And, and it's pretty impressive how, how close it is when you measure it and you put the calibration routine in and you go back and check it afterwards. It's amazing um, how, how accurate it is. Thanks, Mike. Um, and thank you, Israel. And thank you, Frank, for those questions. Uh, another question uh, from Michael. Uh, I see how this helps robot paint operations. How would this help with human paint application? Oh, that's interesting. I didn't include a, a human scan, but we, we did them actually last week when we were at CFAN and we compared the output of their manual process to their automated process. And um, obviously you can get the same pattern you can spray a static pattern or dynamic pattern with a manual gun. And it's a great way to help your operators get really comfortable that they're getting good lay down. If the pattern isn't even, if the pattern has a problem, maybe it's a nick in a nozzle, um, maybe there's a problem with a shaping ear or a blocked or partially blocked passage in the horn or whatever, um, you can pick that right up. And it's much easier to see in that um, in that color heat heat pattern than um, it is when you're just looking at the um, the sprayed pattern itself on, on craft paper. Gotcha. Um, question in from RG uh, regarding training. How much training is required, Mike, to to get one of these up and running? Actually, it's pretty quick we can get it running in a day or so um it it is it is an extremely complex system and yet it is very very well laid out and it's very intuitively obvious when you're using it and you start to pick up very very quickly much like the tools you're used to on your desktop that they all work the same way so as you move from module to module within the software it works the same way, and so it makes perfect sense when you go to use it. Even better, um, being online, there's a whole host of training videos for each one of the modules in there. So say you haven't done calibration in a while, you can run to the online help manual, pick up a two and a half minute video that will show you the exact process. It'll walk you right through it, and you can go, oh yeah, I remember how I did that, and you could jump right in and do it. So it's great for those things that you maybe don't do as often. So it 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 takes a little bit of training, but I in general I would say you're going to be up and running in this with the system the first day that you put it in place. Okay, um, got another question in from Frank. So. Uh... Mike, can we use the dynamic spray pattern dry film thickness data to simulate in an offline simulation software to predict film thicknesses on different areas on the actual part? Uh, yeah, you can, because that's telling you what's coming out of your gun. So as long as you've got the, um, the, the um, robot speed path, distance and angle to the part, 
the same, you know, always staying perpendicular to the surfaces, always the same distance away, always the same flow rate, uh, you can indeed um, predict exactly what you're going to see. And that's the nice part about this. You're getting an actual measurement of the actual pattern from your actual gun to feed into that simulation. And so it's going to be significantly more accurate than if you're just estimating, eh, it's about a four inch pattern and we're gonna say 50% of it is my overlap. This is gonna give you a much more accurate um, set of dimensions to use. And, and then of course, like I mentioned, you can always go back you can put dots in critical areas, maybe around a corner on, on a, say, a bumper unit, or maybe you're doing a mirror housing. Or um, in the case of the fan blades, these are extremely complex curvature on these things. And you can use the tape and the spots to go back and check specific areas on your part after the program is completed to check your work and make sure that you're getting exactly what you expect to. And if not, it gives you the opportunity to go back and fix it before you start painting even your very first part. Frank, uh, I hope that was able to answer your question. If you have a follow-up, uh, feel free to follow up on that. Uh, in the meantime, Mike, so, so you're scanning wet paint. So you spray a foil with wet paint and then you're putting it on the scanner. So do I, have, do I have to do any cleaning? Isn't the, is it the paint going to get on the scanner? Or the um, capture unit, rather? In general, it the films are placed dry side down on the scanner bed. But anybody here that's been in a paint operation knows paint gets everywhere. So you do pick up from the edges and that kind of thing. You pick up some paint on the scanner bed. Now, you can use a solvent. I use simple IPA wipes when we were working last week and just use a simple IPA wipe and a dry cloth to clean the paint off the scanner bed. And it is it is glass, it is impervious to solvents and that kind of thing. So cleanup is a breeze and we had no problems whatsoever. And it's also very easy to see on there. So we could look at the bed of the scanner after we took the, the foil off and see, oh, well, we got a little bit of paint on here. And you just wipe it off, clean it up. And it was it was really quick, really easy. So yeah, um, my experience with it is it's super easy to clean. And that's that's part of the deal where it's not your it's not all plastic and that kind of thing. It's built out of metal and it and metal and glass and, and it's it's built out of good stuff. It's meant for an industrial environment such as a paint operation. Okay, um, we've got another question from Michael. Uh, can this be transported to a customer's location? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, that's exactly what we did at CFAN. We transported it in, set it up, and went to work. And literally the same day that we set it up. And yes, you can take it. We, we have them that we use for demo. And we do just that. We'll bring the unit in, set it up, and then run it in your operation to show you exactly what you're going to get in your process using your robots, your operators, your paint. And that'll give you a really good feel that the unit actually will do what we've said it will do. To do that, we have to carry the unit in. So um, it's we ship it in, it can be carried in, you can drive it in, you can fly it in, you can do whatever you want, uh, uncreate it, set it up, and uh, you're ready to go. Literally, uh, we were ready to go within a half an hour after we got the crate open. Um, just, uh, I think we've got one final question, unless anybody else has another question, but uh, can the foils be reused? You know, that's a great question. Um, they are impervious to solvent and you could wipe them down. But I think one of the things that's key is you want them very clean before you start. And you wanna start with them pretty flat when you're applying them to your surface or when you're putting them on your, your uh, fixture area to do your test pattern. They're fairly inexpensive. So I think my recommendation would be to use a clean film every time so that you know the accuracy 
see of your result. You don't have to worry about picking up something that was left over from your last test. All right, thank you. Um, I don't see any other questions in the, uh, the box. If anybody has one, uh, feel free. Uh, if not, then um, if you wanna have a further conversation, and go to a little bit more detail. Uh, like I said, please reach out to Mike or myself, uh, email addresses uh, listed below, uh, and we'd be more than happy to have a further conversation. Uh, and as Mike mentioned, uh, there's also the opportunity uh, for the demo as well. Um, so if there are no other questions, we again wanna thank everybody uh, for attending today. Uh, it's been a pleasure and we look forward to uh, working with you in the future. Thanks, Ian.